Hey everybody, this is Justin Bogard. I am from, well, my company is Bright Path Notes and this is the Real Estate Note Investing Be The Bank Meetup. So what we do is we educate about note investing, really, performing, non-performing loans and things like that. So we'll get into some note basics and things like that, but we got some house items that we want to take care of and let you guys know what we do here. So once I click here, there we go. So there I am. There's uh, me, Justin Bogard. There's my email, justin at brightpathnotes.com. If you have any questions, don't forget, Bright Path Notes has a Facebook page. We have a Twitter account. We have an Instagram page. And I have a LinkedIn that you can follow me on, or you can, you can link up with me if that's the correct word to use. And we have a Venmo account, a Vimeo account, where we have, host some educational videos there. Uh, big fat disclaimer for those of you that have been to my meetup, you know this happens every time. So I'm not an attorney, I'm not a tax consultant, I'm not a financial advisor, I'm a note investor. And excuse me for a second. So this meetup wouldn't be possible for some sponsorship here. Um, so my company sponsors this as well. So we focus on the note deals where cash, our um, slogan is we've got the deal flow to make your cash flow. Our local Indianapolis real estate group uh, called CIREA, Central Indiana Real Estate Investor Association. They also sponsor our meetup as well. And if you're interested, they are the real estate education arm of um, kind of what we do here. So they talk about all things real estate, rentals, short terms, fix and flips, wholesaling, notes, and just design on houses. Uh, they got a lot of great vendors for that. So if you're interested in being a part of that group, even if you're out of state, you can still be a part of that group as well. Hit up Vicki Perry. And uh, like I said before, the shared workspace that I have a member of as well when I'm not working at the home office is called Launch Fishers. And that's typically where we have this meetup. It's usually live in person. Uh, in the future, we'll be doing live and streaming it online at the same time. So Libby Hales is your contact there. And pretty much if you haven't been to a work shared workspace, it's kind of like a big building that a bunch of entrepreneurs or small business owners or even salespeople can go to and just kind of set up camp for the day or maybe a few, a few weeks or that's their permanent office is there and you can have places to meet people there. There's private offices. You can make phone calls and you can reserve rooms that are bigger for conferences and stuff. And they give you all the electronics you need with Wi-Fi and high speed internet. So Dickie Baldwin is one of our newest sponsors. He was a sponsor before and now he's a sponsor again. And he focuses on the due diligence and that's what we want to highlight. So we do all of our due diligence through Dickie Baldwin. That means we to get property inspections or to get BPOs, get values on houses, uh, doing title searches. He does um, have some skip tracing capabilities. He has a lot of other things that he offers as well. So Dickie Baldwin's a, a, a very valuable resource for our company and we definitely highly recommend him. So bag, one bag for all your real estate services. I like that. So here we go. So once again, for those of you that are part of Cyria, don't forget to follow them on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And there are their, um, I guess you call them their social media handles there. I do have a YouTube channel. They post a lot of videos to it as well. That's a great resource for some free education on real estate. And let's not forget for PHP credits, you can enter in your smartphone or if you have a, another monitor, you can go to the URL and you can type in HTTP colon forward slash forward slash B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash Cyria notes. That's C-I-R-E-I-A N-O-T-E-S. Okay. So, I also am a co-host on a podcast. It's also a video cast as well. So me and my friend Super E, so some of you that are locals here know who Super E is. She is the uh, short-term kind of um, uh, guru here in town. And so we kind of talk anything and all things real estate to help people understand how to build their wealth. And that's what we focus on. We're on all the typical podcast channels. You can look up the Two Wealth Show and find it there. And don't forget on YouTube, we stream all of the um, podcasts we do through video. So we record them and upload them to my YouTube channel, Bright Path Notes. So you can look that up. So today is September 9th. All right, we made it this far. So we're going to be talking about the note basics, which we always do to help people understand that are first timers for our note meetup to get an idea of what the heck a note investing is. This will give you kind of the elementary level of how this happens and, and what's going on here. Uh, we'll touch on a little bit of the mortgage industry update for some changes that have happened. Um, since COVID-19 has happened, I've been monitoring this a lot more closely than I typically do because we've had some advanced changes as far as 
forbearances and delinquencies and seeing how the, how the industry is as of right now. So we got some, some updates for you there and then it's going to be open mic night. So then again, feel free to uh, fill up the Q and a board, feel free to use the chat and then have some questions in mind because you can be unmuted and we can have a conversation about exactly what's going on with your, with your note deal that you're working on, or if you have some questions about some things or some due diligence questions or post closing or recording or anything like that, you know, we're here to support you and I'm here to answer your questions. So please have some questions in mind. I'll be more than happy to answer them for you. So without further ado, we'll kind of get into the note basics. And by the way, feel free to use the chat board and feel free to use the Q and A at any time. We'll be monitoring them. I got it on a separate monitor here so I can take a look at what's going on. So, all right, when we have a house, we sell a house. This house is sold and it has to have a buyer and a seller, right? So we got these two people in this exchange business. So the seller is typically on the deed of the house, right? Because they own it. So they want to give ownership to the new buyer. The new buyer goes to the closing table through a, typically through a title company. And then the, the new homeowner is probably not gonna have all cash to put down. Typically they'll get some sort of mortgage help or help from a bank. And that's where this bank creates this note in mortgage for the borrower. So now the borrower has put down a down payment, the down payment goes to the seller and the bank uh, fulfills the rest of the purchase contract by giving the, uh, the homeowner um, a lien on the house, a note in mortgage, and then it's paid, everything's paid to the seller. So now the bank, get this, they own the paper. They don't really own the house, right? They're just the lien holder on the house. So we just wanna make that clear. The bank owns the note and the buyer owns the house because they're on the deed. That's for a note and mortgage. All right, so let's understand how this works as far as investing goes and you know how we are going to invest in something like this. So once again, the homeowner has owned the house now. They have paid for it. They've got a bank note, a note and mortgage as we call it loosely. And so they're on the deed. So an investor now can purchase this note and mortgage. That investor can be a retirement account. It can be a trust account. It could be an LLC or it can be an individual as well. All these things with lump, a lump sum of cash can buy the mortgage note from, this is called the bank. And that's all they do. They simply just pay cash for the note. Notice nothing else changed hands besides the money went to the bank and the bank released the note and mortgage to the new owner and they convey that ownership via an allonge and assignment of mortgage. So now the monthly payments for the borrower. They don't change as far as what the borrower owes in the terms of the deal. What does change is they don't pay bank A now, they pay this new investor or bank B now. And so the thousand dollar payment they pay a month was going to the bank. Now it's pushed off and going to the investor. So that's what you're investing in. And that's what we call a performing loan. So any questions on that, feel free to, to shoot up the board there uh, with the chat box, the Q and A. So let's get into some mortgage trends 2020. Actually, I took this slide from the internet. It's really a mortgage industry update. It's just the coolest thing I could find to help transition us into the next part of the presentation here. The national delinquency rate. Those of you that have been on this meetup before, you know I get a lot of my information from Black Knight Financial Data. They are an incredible source of information for me to find out kind of what's going on in the mortgage business. So you'll notice that the national delinquency rate is pretty much anything that's over uh, 30 days late is kind of documented in this graph right here. So you notice back in 2009 and probably a February of 2009 or 2010, wherever this lands in the spectrum, I think it's February, 2010, we were pretty much at about 11% delinquency rate at that point. And that was the height of the worst case scenario for, um, all that stuff. And it kind of trickled down and our economy got better and it got better and got better and got better and got better and got better, and got better until we hit, you know, the COVID-19. So it got down to almost about 3%. Actually, I think it dipped below 3% for maybe right at 3%. And then in March, everything kind of went, went backwards. And so it jumped up to about seven and three quarters percent, I believe. And now ever since, uh, April, it's come down a little bit each month. So now it's below 7%. So it's, we're starting to see the effect 
of COVID-19, and now we're starting to see the, uh, the, down, the downfall from it. So it's getting better is what I'm saying. The average, this little green line here, is just really what, it, what our delinquency rate does throughout the year. It's just constantly up and down, up and down, depending on the season, right? It makes sense during Christmas time. We typically see more delinquencies then because uh, parents and families typically put their money towards gifts and stuff as opposed to paying their mortgage. So that isn't uncommon. So it doesn't appear we're too far from what our normal is. Looks like it gets up around maybe 5% as typical and it gets down to four. So in between four to 5% is typically the average range with some outliers there. So we're, we're, we're getting back down to, to normal here, which is a good sign. All right. So the change in delinquency rate, so this data is captured from February of 2020 all the way through July of 2020. So you notice that the blue dots here are all above national averages as far as delinquency is concerned. So that means they're, they become more delinquent or they're above the national average, which is 6.91%. The green dots here are showing below the national average of 6.91%. So you notice New York, New Jersey, the East Coast here, the very heavy, busy uh, areas for businesses are getting hit hard. Florida's getting hit very hard. Texas is getting hit hard. And California is getting hit hard with more and more delinquency rates. You notice the Midwestern areas and more of the, uh, the blue collar states and stuff, they're not hit as hard expected to be Chicago right there, you know, to be hit a little bit harder. So that's just kind of giving you the lay of the land of how delinquency is affected in each kind of major metropolitan area that we looked at. So, oh, here we go. I got the charts here. Good. So you notice number one, Miami, Florida is, is, uh, had a one month delinquency rate change of 8%. That's, that's quite a bit. So let's see a couple of Florida. So we've got one, two, three Floridas in here. We got a Nevada, New Jersey, Louisiana, California. There's only one in California. That's not bad. And then Dallas, Texas is there. And then on the other side of the fence, we've got more of the positives again. I think I've shown this before where Indianapolis was in there as well as a good sign. Um, San Francisco is a good sign. I'm surprised to see that. San Jose as well. That's good. That means things are leveling off. So Midwestern areas um, are doing pretty well. So I got a couple of questions here. Let me look at this real quick. Okay, so Albert, I'm gonna answer your question here. You asked, uh, how long does the tenant, well, you mean the borrower, need to be paying in order for it to, to be considered performance? That's a great question. I should have stepped back and, and uh, talked that through. But performing loan is pretty much anybody that pays on time. So. I'm sorry, before the next payment's due, it, it can be late and still considered a performing loan. So if their payment is due the first of the month, they have until before the first of the next month to make their payment for it to be considered a performing loan. So as long as they're paying every month, it doesn't matter when it is during the month, that is what we consider a performing loan. And so they wouldn't fall into this category here of delinquency. So if they went beyond 30 days, then they would fall into this category of delinquency and they would be in this data. So hopefully that clarifies that for you, Albert. And then let's see, uh, which months are these for? I probably went too fast, Lola, but I'll just go ahead and try and answer that for you. And this particular data is from, that we're seeing on this screen is February through July. If you were talking about a previous slide, let me know and I apologize um, if I went too far. Um, okay, so the slide before that was just the national delinquency rate, and it was basically from the year 2000 to the year 2020, and that's what you were seeing, that big spike in 2010, and then it came back down, and then 2020, it, it jumped up kind of abruptly. So hopefully that answers your question, Lola. All right, got that cleared on the board. So forbearances. Everyone's heard about forbearances and you're probably sick of hearing about it, but this is what the data is showing us. So if you ignore this dark blue line for now and focus on this down here, this is, this is what's going on. So Fannie Mae is in green, FHA, VA is in blue, and then other is, you know, anything else outside of that that's uh, documented is in the gray. So you notice everything from March of March 24 all the way up to looks like about May 11th, it got 
all the forbearances got in and then it kind of tapers off and then it kind of jumps back down a little bit to some comma. So this darker blue line is the total of all those, those three curves combined. So you notice it jumps way up here and then it kind of flattens out in May and then it starts to dip down in June and July, it took a nice big dip and then it's kind of slowly tapered down and that's the trend it's going for right now. So this means people that are in active forbearance and you're gonna see a slide here in a minute to kind of digest all that. So that's what this slide is. So the current status of COVID-19 related forbearances, this status is as of August 25th, 2020. So it's fairly, fairly recent. So we'll just take this a slice at a time on the pie to make sure we understand this. So we're gonna start off by talking about the green slide, which is the good stuff. So of the entire, what's this called, 4 million loans that are in forbearance, let's just say, 1.5 million of these are removed, expired, meaning their forbearance only lasted for about 120 days or so. And then they had the option, they could start paying again or they could pay off the loan. And so this particular part of the pie, their forbearance had expired, but they're back paying again. So 26% of the people in forbearance have already started to pay again and things are working like clockwork, okay? Also of this entire pie, 4% of those, so 275,000 of those actually paid off their loan, whether they sold their house or they refied or what, whatever they did is basically they, they escaped it. So about 30% total is, is the good here. So another 4% were the bad. So that means they passed their forbearance period and they just went dark and delinquent and they basically are gonna go through foreclosure more than likely. So we gotta monitor that. It's not a very large number, but it is a number that you wanna, you wanna see for yourself. So 18% of the loans are still in forbearance. You notice a lot of people went into forbearance at the you know, April or, or March timeframe, and some of them went into forbearance in the June and July timeframe. So that's why you still see people in forbearance that haven't expired yet. And then um, the darkest blue here, the 48%, the biggest category, are people that are still in for, forbearance, and they also had to extend their forbearance as well. So hopefully that all made sense. <clears throat> So I thought this was an interesting chart here. So the forbearance status of past due mortgages by investor. So the dark blue is in forbearance and the light gray is not in forbearance. So if you look at pre-COVID-19 delinquencies over here, hopefully you can see my mouse moving on the screen. You see FHA and VA loans, it's about balanced between not forbearance and forbearance. And you see this, um, the delinquencies for the GSEs, it's kind of balanced. About half of those delinquencies are in forbearance and half of them were not. This is before COVID-19. You see the portfolio and the private. Now, post-COVID-19, you see it totally changes the dynamic of what's going on here. So FHA and VLA, VA, you see out of all the, all the past due mortgages, let's just call it 80% of them are in forbearance, okay? The GSEs, are really hit hard here. So that's government, should be government sponsored in enterprises. So that means Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Jenny Mae. So those are the loans that are easiest for borrowers to get, but they also have probably the most um, consequences to them, if you will. So they have to pay the PMI and things like that, like forever now, I believe. So those are what GSEs are. So it's Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and Jenny Mae. I see, uh, Reggie, I saw that question come up right as I was getting ready to answer it. <clears throat> so a lot has changed for the GSEs, but it makes sense because those borrowers are the ones that needed the most help to get a mortgage because they typically had very low down payments and they probably had okay credit. So those those borrowers are the ones I'm not surprised the GSEs had more forbearances and delinquencies than, than other categories. <clears throat> so that was just an interesting chart. So if you have any questions about kind of what the mortgage update was, feel free to, to shoot a Q&A or hit me up on the chat board um, because guess what now is? It is open mic night. If you want to sing, I might let you sing for 30 seconds. Nothing's guaranteed though. This is your chance to ask me 
any question that you want about note investing, whether it's a beginning entry level question, or if it's a more advanced question, or if you're working on a deal, if you're working on a, or if you bought a loan before and you got a question about something, feel free to start that process. Just hit me up on the, on the question or the chat board and let me know what you got. If you don't want to get on mic and be unmuted, that's okay. You can just ask the question and I'll kind of do the talking for you because apparently I'm, I'm good at that now. <clears throat> Read what's going on on the boards here. I know Dennis always has a question. Dennis, would you like to be unmuted to ask your question? All right, cool. We got a couple of questions coming up here. All right, so I'm going to find Dennis and I'm going to unmute you so you can ask the question. Where are you on the board, Dennis? All right, I've allowed you to talk. Can you hear me? I can hear you, my friend. How are you? All right. All right. Hey, um, I have a loan, uh, uh, owner finance, excuse me, I got other people. Here. I have an owner <laughs> financing question. Well, um, okay. I have one that may be paying off this month, um, but I was kind of curious on uh, how do I get that that lean off of there uh the house has been pretty much condemned <laughs> it's a long long story so i definitely want to get my my name off of it since it's still in my name but is there a form or do i have to go to a title company or how do i finish this loan off so you have a loan and it's mm -hmm. not performing it, it it's performing Okay. Actually, he paid me $3,000 a couple of months ago. He didn't make a payment last month, and he hasn't made one. He was going to pay it off. It was about $5,000 more. He was going to pay it off this month, but okay. I haven't gotten that check yet. And I've been calling and trying to hunt him down. He changed his number. He's, he's got one of those what, uh, those phones you dispose of, yeah. I guess. He, every time he calls me, it's a different number. He's got a burner anyway, phone. I, yeah, burner phones, I guess. Because every time I call him, it, you know, right. he's not there. I'll, I'll, I'll text him, I email him, I don't get anything back. So, so I don't know. All right, so you have this loan. This guy has paid you a little bit, but he's kind of gone dark. He owes you about five grand left on it. So you just want to wipe the slate clean and get this debt off the house, and you just want to get off the deed as well? Is it no, actually, way? actually, I made the story longer than it needed to be. Okay. I, my question is, he say that he does pay it off like he said he was going to do this month. Yeah. Now I have to get that lien off of that, my mortgage lien off of. The, the, so the, is, it, is it a note and mortgage or is it a land contract? Land contract. So you have, to do a cancel, <laughs> you have to do a cancellation of land contract and then you need to transfer the deed from your, I'm assuming your company to this individual. Okay. All uh, right. Now, the only deed I have on it is a tax deed. Can I? Is it, I the only thing, only deed you have on it is a tax deed. Is that what you said? Yes. Yeah. So you'll want to go through an attorney or a title company to make sure that's clear, to make sure it gets your information off of there. But yeah, basically if you're satisfied with the debt that he's paid, or if you're willing to let go of the remaining balance, you just do a cancellation of land contract and, I assume you recorded this land contract with the county or did you not record it? Uh, it's recorded. Okay, yeah, so you do cancellation of land contract so the lien's off there and then go through the, an attorney, your, your, whoever attorney did your tax deed or if you need another one, I can recommend one. Well, it was the, it was the county that did it. It was the auditor or whoever does that. Okay, yeah, I would go through title, your, your yeah. favorite choice title company or an attorney to get that that part of it cleared up and get it in his name and so you get yourself out of it okay all right good Appreciate question it. all right 
Have a good evening. All right, see ya. All right, got a few more questions popped up here. I'm gonna take the Q and A ones first. I see some on the chat board as well, so let me do this. All right, um, Reggie asks, what type of analysis is done to acquire a discounted note? That's a great question. So there's about six factors that make up the value of a note, in my opinion, most people's opinions too. There's the interest rate, there's the terms of the deal, there's a security instrument that it's written on, which is basically like what I talked about with Dennis, like land contract, note and mortgage, deed of trust. There is the down payment that the borrower um, put down. And then there's, you know, the, um, the collateral. How can I forget that one? So about, and then the, the pay history of the borrower as well. So all those six factors kind of weigh in how I gauge how much discount a note I think should have on it before I purchase it or before someone working with us purchases it. And so this is what the due diligence comes in handy where you're reviewing all that information. So you want to make sure the property value is more than the unpaid balance for performing loan. Makes sense, right? Because you don't want to pay more for something that's worth, you know, let's say a loan has a hundred thousand dollars left on it and the property is worth 75,000. Are you going to pay $95,000 for that note? No, you're not going to pay that. You're going to pay less than 75,000 because you're trying to protect your investment, right? So something happened and the borrower got upside down. So that's, that's kind of what I would do to approach that. And that's kind of um, what we help our, our investors do when they, when they purchase their loan through us. So that's the analysis I do on it. So the collateral, I'm probably reviewing stuff online as far as what the as is value, what homes are selling for. Sometimes you get lucky and Trulia or Zillow or other of those online websites will show kind of some recently updated pictures of the property and maybe even some inside photos of it as well. So you can get a, an idea of what it looks like that helps as well. So you got to you know, focus on your collateral, then all those other things about the deal. So I like pay history a lot. It tells me a lot of story about this loan before I price it out and I can feel really confident or I can feel really iffy about it. And if I don't like that, then I'll lower my bid price and say, I'm willing to pay this much for this loan based on the factors. Reggie type back in if I didn't answer your question. So um, I'll go down the list here. So Linda had a good question. What notes are you focused on now? So I'm not focused on non-performing. I am not focused on reperforming or what they call subperforming. I'm focused on kind of strong performing loans. And so my price point that I'm shopping for is probably between 30 to $50,000 per loan. I find that the collateral value is probably worth 60 to 80,000 in value as is. And I've been able to find some pretty strong borrowers at that price point. So that's about the loans that I'm shopping for. So they'll be performing. They're more than likely land contract type of loans. Uh, rarely will I find note and mortgages. But the good thing is, is that once I buy the, the land contract, I can also convert it to a note and mortgage if I want to in the future. Um, you know, I want to go through a title company to convey a warranty deed and stuff and, and pay for a note and mortgage because I'm shopping like in different states. So, not just in Indiana, but the Midwest areas and some Southern states. Um, There's a place I'm definitely not shopping in. That's places like Florida and New York, New Jersey, um, Chicago, Illinois, definitely not. California, some West Coast states I don't really, I don't really go to. I have done Kansas and Oklahoma and uh, Arizona, I believe as well. So I hope that answers your question, Linda. All right, so we'll ask a good question here. Assuming everything is perfect, is it reasonable to bid for a greater than 30% return based on UPB? So is it reasonable? I mean, you can always throw out the bid. More than likely, you're not going to be able to get a loan from somebody with that steep of a discount. If you're looking for a 30% return in a performing note, you're probably gonna to have to create the loan yourself and have very little into the property. So typically how that happens, what I'm saying is you buy a piece of property at a you know pretty good wholesale price, you put what you need to get into it to make it safe, sound and secure, and then you sell it for a lot more than what you have in it. So say you bought it for 50,000, you had to put 10,000 in it to do some repairs and some light rehab. 
And let's say, so you have 60 into it. So let's say you sell it for 90 or $95,000 and somebody puts 10 grand down. You're looking at an $85,000 note when you have $50,000 into it. So that's a pretty good discount. And if you're selling it at a 10% interest rate or whatnot, you know, your, your yield could be much higher, like 15 to 20% based on that stuff. So I don't know if I've ever seen one at 30%, uh, maybe for a piece of land, I've seen them that high, but for a real estate single family backed uh, note, I haven't really seen one that high before. So I don't think it's realistic for it everything, assumed everything's perfect. Now I've seen some ones that are pretty damaged that are performing loans that I've gotten some, some pretty high returns on. I'm not sure about 30, but um, yeah, that, that can happen. So good question. All right, Linda also asks, how do you negotiate a discount discounted note? So back to what, what Reggie was saying about the, uh, the factors of a loan, how do I determine a value of a loan, if you will, I'm paraphrasing for what he said, is you're going to the seller and saying, if it's a mom and pop seller, like someone that just created the loan and you're, you're sending direct mail to them, you're, you're basically telling them all the things that are wrong with your loan. Be like, you're not servicing it with a professional servicer, so how do I know the unpaid balance is correct? I'm going off your word. Like they may have overpaid or underpaid, then how did you correct the balance when it maybe was daily simple simple interest um, uh, amortization? You know, the collateral value may be crap. You know, the pay history may be shoddy or maybe missing payments or whatnot. And then maybe the loan's written on a land contract that really doesn't look that good or that an attorney didn't, didn't draft it. Maybe it's on a napkin. I mean, there's a lot of factors that you can discount a note heavily from a buyer. And if they're wanting to sell it, then they got to understand like you're not willing to buy their problem. You're, you're going to buy their problem to fix it and you want to be able to fix it for a certain price. And that price is going to be built into that. So typically um, I'll still buy those loans if the seller is wanting to, but more than likely the sellers don't like to hear the, you know, 30% um, discount off of, you know, unpaid balance and stuff like that. So that's kind of how I negotiate with a mom and pop seller with a hedge fund or somebody that's more professional. I'm probably going to focus more on if I find something in title or if I find something about the collateral that tells me it's not worth what it is, it's typically priced pretty good for what we can get it for, depending on what level you can buy at and which hedge funds that you're and banks that you're working with. And so that's, that's how I would negotiate with a professional seller versus negotiating with like, kind of like a mom and pop. That's a good question, Linda. Sorry. I'm very long winded with my answers too, by the way. All right. Uh, Sharon asks, do you joint venture? So we have done it before in the past. We really don't like to use that word joint venture. We like to say partnership just because a lot of people are getting in trouble with joint ventures because they're not setting them up the right way. But yes, all in all, we'll figure out a way to partner with somebody if we need to. Typically it's somebody that is first time in the business and they understand that they like how this all works and everything, but they don't necessarily want to take the plunge by themselves. So sometimes we're partnering with them, whether they're, they're buying a partial from us or we buy part of the deal and they buy the front part of the deal, uh, which gets a little more complicated. But yeah, we, we do venture with people in that sense, but we call it kind of a partnership. Um, Albert asked, let's see, uh, how do you expect forbearances to be at the end of the year? Would you expect a rise? You know, that's a good question. I don't have a crystal ball, but I do have a rear view mirror is the best way I can describe it. And so to answer that question, I would say I don't see forbearances being worse at the end of the year, just from the data that we saw on the mortgage update that I did. And by the way, if anybody wants to get uh, unmuted, just feel free to, to put that in the chat box, the Q&A that you want to speak live. I'm perfectly happy with you speaking live. Um, so how, so I don't expect it to rise and I'm predicting it's just going to come down a little bit more. So Albert, you raised your hand. Did you want to speak? Just ch uh, type in the chat box if you wanted to, to speak and I'll, I'll unmute you here. All right. Albert, you are unmuted. Feel free to unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. All right, cool. Um, yeah, so uh, actually, I wanted to talk uh, about my earlier question. Sure. Um, and the thing about it is, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm viewing it from like a wholesaler's uh, point of view. Okay. When I asked that question, so I meant, um, 
about a performing a performing loan um i meant i meant like the duration like that 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 the loan has to be paid you know what i'm saying like um i don't mean like the first of the month i mean over how many months does the loan have to be uh paid on in order for it to be considered performing or is it just you so one month you just have a mortgage out and then it's yeah. considered a loan you know Basically, so yeah. one so month, really? as long as they made a payment and they made it with before the next due date, it's considered a performing loan. Whether it's one payment's been made or 50 payments have been made, that's how we decipher that it's a performing loan. That's what, that's what we go off of. Okay. Does that answer the question? Yeah, that answers my okay. question there. Yeah. What and else um, you got, man? Fire away. You're on, you're on the mic. You're on the hot seat. Yeah, sure. Yeah, the hot seat. Um <laughs> I'm um, not okay. So um, yeah. I didn't mean to put you um, on the spot there. Yeah, what I really want to say is um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. So um, no problem. Just go ahead and yeah, mute yourself, yeah. and then we'll we'll get going here with some more questions that just pop up on the board. All right, go ahead. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, Dennis wanted you to sing, Albert. That was your chance, buddy. <laughs> All right, Keith, I see you got a question pop up here. Is it typically a good rule to have at least 24 months of consistent payments? That's an excellent question. The more payments, more consistent payments that you see in the pay history is obviously the better. My minimum kind of depends on a couple factors. So I've bought a loan with one month of seasoning. Um, because it had a 50% down payment and it was basically a hundred thousand um, dollar loan or value house. And they put down $50,000 then a $50,000 unpaid balance left on the note. So I felt it was very low risk going after it with one payment. I've also had to see two or three years of pay history before I felt comfortable enough to pull the trigger on a note because somebody was, yeah, they skipped a few payments or they got back on track. And then I kind of saw a history of what happened. Usually in 12 months, you see a cycle of when they really have a struggle paying and when they don't have a struggle paying and you can kind of predict what goes on from there. So hopefully that, that um, answers your question. But I'm typically, if I see about eight months of pay history and it's pretty solid, I'm okay pulling the trigger on it um, as long as there's a, there's a good down payment. If there's not a good down payment, like, you know, very little, like a thousand or 500 or $2,000, I want to see a couple of years of pay history. That makes me feel better that they've got some emotional equity, you know, kind of built into that, that property. By the way, if anybody else wants to, wants to, wants to um, chime in or say anything, use the raise hand feature. I like how Albert did that. And then I can find you on the board and, and get you um, unmuted here. So Philip asked, how often do you sell your notes and where can I find notes for sale? Good question. So our inventory is comprised of either partnering with people, it's our just actual capital and then I have, you know, retirement accounts and my wife has retirement accounts. My kids have a trust accounts and stuff. And depending on which silo those notes are in is dependent upon if I'll actually sell them or not. So right now, a lot of our inventory is tied up in our retirement accounts. So we're not going to sell that stuff right away. We're going to kind of let that build for a little bit. But our company inventory, typically we're okay selling that, you know, right after we get it because the idea of it is just to build and do a velocity model. So if you go to our brightpathnotes.com webpage and you see our notes for sale, there's probably a handful of them that we have released right now. And we're getting ready to add another four or five more to put out there as well. So that's one place you can go. Um, there's other companies out there online that sell notes. Um, if you want to get with me, I can help you source them as well with some of the hedge funds that we work with. Uh, but I've just kind of built relationships over the years, you know, from, from going to events and stuff and getting to know people that are kind of the managers of some funds and stuff. And so just getting in with them, uh, I've been able to find some sources. I have, I have some private sellers uh, locally here and, and in other states that I've gotten to know that, ha that just create a bunch of loans every year. And so I work with them as well. 
that's kind of where I've built my sources as well. <clears throat> so hopefully that answers your question about how often I sell the notes. All right, let's get back in here. So, all right, Missy, it is my understanding that a loan has to be paid on time for at least six months and preferably 12 for it to be considered a performing note. It's kind of, it's kind of a gray area on, there's no like hard steadfast rule, I believe that says what constitutes a performing note versus non-performing. How I've been trained and how most people I know in this business consider performing loan, as long as it's paid before the next month is due, it's in a performing category. If they go past 31 day threshold, then it's considered sub-performing. And if it goes past the 91st day or the 90th day, it's considered non-performing. And that's just a general rule. Everyone has their little tweaks to it, but I do go by that. And that's what I consider performing versus sub-performing versus non-performing. Now, a re-performing loan is a non-performing loan that got performing again. So, yeah, Missy, let me know if I didn't, didn't answer that all the way. All right, can you convert a non-performing note to a performing note or do you stay away from these notes? Uh, yes, you absolutely can. So if you buy a non-performing note intentionally, you kind of got three options and you may know this al already. So the first option is to renegotiate the terms of the deal. And that's, that's the more popular option to do uh, because then you can get those very large returns, right? Maybe you bought a note for 50 cents on the dollar, let's say, and then you renegotiate the terms with them and they get paying again. And you could be, they could be having $80,000 balance now and you could have $50,000 into it. You have a lot of protection. So that's one way to go. Renegotiate the terms. If that doesn't work, then my next fail safe is to ask for a deed in lieu of foreclosure. So that is where you say, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Borrower, I understand that you can't afford to stay here anymore. I love to help you out. I don't want you to have to go through foreclosure and put that stain on your record. How about you just sign the deed back over to me? I'll give you uh, some moving expenses, maybe $700,000. And if you keep that house in broom swept condition, then we got a fair deal. So that way I avoid foreclosure and avoid cost and time with foreclosure, and then they can get out and on their way quickly. And it's just a clean, quick deal. And then lastly is the foreclosure. That's what will happen with a non-performing loan. So sorry, I just wanna kind of get some education there, Linda, on that. But yes, you can convert non-performing loan to a performing loan, and that's what we would call a re-performing loan. Um, would I stay away from those notes? Uh, not necessarily, it kind of depends. I would do some history or, so, or some background check on the non-performing loan. I'd wanna make sure that the borrower actually lives in the house, because sometimes they're just vacant and squatters are there. And so I check, I just check a couple other things like that. If I know that they're living there and they just, they have some struggles, then that's a really good chance for a re-performer. All right, Lola wanted to follow up here. Let's get her going. If I wanted to bid on a performing loan, everything being perfect, of course, right? And there is no suggested price, what percent return should I expect and bid on the UPB? You can really bid whatever you feel necessary for that loan. Um, they, if it's a professional seller and they don't have a strike price on there, like, like a bid price, they're going to be expecting to get a premium for it because most people don't want any challenges with their performing loan. I mean, I don't really want the challenges. I just want to set it and forget it. So you can pretty much bet a lot of it's going to have to do the collateral value so if you have a $100,000 unpaid balance and the collateral is worth $150,000, well, I'd feel really comfortable bidding close to 100% unpaid balance, right? Because you got all that protection. It doesn't say that you have to do that, but you can, you can be very well protected. But if that house is worth $110,000 and you're got a strike, you know, your bid price is, you know, right at $100,000, that's not a lot of cushion. So I'd probably back it off to 95 to 90% of unpaid balance. Um, that's kind of the rule of thumb for like, let's just say a, a perfect note, if you will. The more problems it has, the lower my price is going to go. And maybe your yield expectation is a very high yield expectation. Then you're probably not going to see a lot of loans out there. But if you're just looking for moderate loans that are just good performing and good paying loans, 
then getting eight, nine, 10% return on your money is very common. It's very, very easy to get. Sometimes with those loans that you do the calculator, you're like, oh, this is gonna be a 14% return. This is awesome. They typically don't pay every month or pay on time. They usually become a problem. So, uh, you know, with higher yield, more problems, I guess is, is what, I, what I'm saying. All right. For these notes loans out of state, what do you use as your POC to check on the property? <clears throat> so Reggie, you'll have to describe to me what um, your what the POC means. Um, I'm assuming probably point of contact. Is that is that what you're saying? I think that's what you're saying. Thank you, point of contact. So Dickie Baldwin, our sponsor, he is our due diligence guy. He's pretty much who we get all our due diligence through. And he can send out a property inspection company to go to those properties and take photographs and jot down notes. And they have a checklist of things that they have to go by. Like, is this by a railroad? Is it uh, backed up to a swamp? You know, is there somebody living there? Is it look, um, does the house look like it's damaged? Is the meter run? You know, they have this whole checklist of things to go on. And they also take photographs of the property in real time. So we call that a property inspection. A BPO is similar to that, but they focus more on what is the neighborhood value of a home like this. And we find that those values aren't that valid because when the price point of the house is lower than $80,000, typically you're not going to see conventional financing loans in that price point. So a BPO is going to be based on typically cash values in the area. So if there are some blighted and beat up homes in the area and your home is kind of pristine, but all they have to go off of is cash comps in the area and they say it's only worth $24,000 when it's a, easily a $70,000 home, you kind of lose the effect of the report. So just food for thought, we typically get property inspections on homes and not worry about the BPO value unless we had to get it for some reason. Unless the property is worth probably more than $80,000, then we would feel more comfortable getting a BPO uh, because they still show the pictures and they still show if there's any damages out there. So we use Dickie Baldwin for that. Sorry for the long-winded answer, but I feel like that could have helped somebody as well. Uh, Keith, is the is the eight to 10% ROI or IRR. The, all that terminology doesn't, doesn't really mean anything until the loan matures. So you can talk about internal rate of return and return on investment. Uh, and internal rate of return, you, you can probably calculate that. We don't really worry about that calculation. Return on investment would be when the loan matures, you can look back and you can say, oh, that was my return on investment over the course of yada, yada, yada years. In notes, we look at yield. And yield is a projectable number based on the predictability of the payments when they come in, which is obviously consistent because it's like $349.50 every month is principal and interest on time, on time, on time. So that's when we say yield. We focus on yield because it's a projectable or it's a forward thinking number. And return on investment is a backward way of thinking. It's, it's the it's like on a flip, you put money into it, then you sell the property. Well, that investment matured. And so you look back and say, my return on my investment is blah. My, my internal rate of return was blah based on my cash. Uh, but we focus on yield is, is kind of how we rate that. Uh, I see you raise your hand, Albert. Let me get through a couple more questions here. All right. For acquiring a performing, uh, Luis sent this in. For acquiring a performing note, the bidding price should account having to go through foreclosure. You can, if you feel the risk of it. Uh, typically, a lot of people I know, they're just like, if the loan was $10,000, they're like, well, I know it's going to cost me $3,000 to go through foreclosure or $2,500. So they're just like, I can, I'll buy it as long as I can get $2,500 discount on it. I've actually done that before on very low value loans based on that, just because you never know. Um, but it's okay to build that in there. There's nothing wrong with that. But you really want to understand the type of loan that you're getting. If it's going to be like a superior paying loan, or if it's kind of a loan that's kind of eh, kind of iffy. Uh, so most loans that you see are kind of iffy. There's 
there are loans out there that are really strong payers at the lower price point of thirty to fifty thousand dollars per loan. So <clears throat> that's a good question, and it's okay to build that in there because if that's what's comfortable for you, then that's what you should do. And truth be told, I kind of I kind of build that in there as well. So if I was going to pay full value for the note, I'd be like, I'm not going to pay hundred percent, but I'll pay hundred percent minus twenty five hundred dollars or whatever, you know. Oh, you're welcome, Philip. Thanks for the nice compliment. Uh, okay, Albert, I'm going to unmute you again. Hey there. Um, so, so I actually I wanted to backtrack a little bit. Uh, you okay. mentioned a point of contact for BPO. What it, what again was that? And how did you uh, wait? And I want to know too. How did you like come across the relationships with um, you know, the managers and things like that in order to have it like a, a exit strategy, pretty much for the notes, you know. Let me answer your first question. So you were talking about the point of contact question that uh, I think Reggie had. You wanted to know what yeah. that is? Mm -hmm. So the point of contact that I was describing is Dickie Baldwin. Uh, his, his company is called Bag Baldwin Advisory Group, and they do the due diligence. They have the vendors that they use or sources they use for getting property inspections. And these are for notes that are out of your state. Like I live in the Indianapolis, Indiana area, but I don't buy all my loans here locally. I wish I could, but that's just, that's not how it works out. So I'm in different states and because I'm in different states, I'm at a distance. I need help from somebody to be boots on the ground and Dickie Ball is the guy that helps us do that. So um, if you need his contact information, just email me at justin at brightpathnotes.com and I will yeah. get that to you um, after the meetup tonight. <clears throat> okay. It's back a few slides. I probably can pull it back up. If you need me to, uh, actually, um, actually, that will work. Actually, yeah. So I could just have it, or if you could repeat it one more time. Yeah, let me see if I can pull it up this way. Okay, here we go. So he's at the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Due diligence. There's his number and there's his email. I'll you leave it up there for a few seconds. Okay. Also, had another question, um, but it's unrelated to notes. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's, um, so it's been like a lot going on, uh, you know, throughout the group and things like that. And, um, one of the biggest things that I've been looking at was, um, starting like a presence on social media and what have you not, but, um, and you know, I've really been interested in the podcast and things like that. Can you tell me how you, how you got started with the podcast? Yeah. So my friend Super E and I, we used to meet kind of once once a month just to kind of rap about what's going on in our businesses and real estate and how she's doing, how I'm doing, how we're growing, kind of collaborate and share ideas on how to become better business owners or entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And I would always tell her, I was like, Super E, or her name, her name is Elizabeth. I'd be like, somebody needs to be a fly on the wall with our conversations because I bet they're just really interesting to somebody to hear how we talk and and the good, the bad, and the ugly and stuff. And so we started a podcast together to help the idea is to help people understand how to build their wealth and focusing on what I do with note investing and what she does in short-term uh, rentals really or Airbnbs. <clears throat> and that's how it got started. So I, we started just recording it on YouTube, just recording a video of it. And then we learned that we act to actually be a podcast. You kind of have to strip out the audio channel and then blast it out to all these different podcast directories so people could just listen to it. What's so the, we figured out, okay. Yeah, we just figured out that you had to do that. So we have um, an account with Buzzsprout that helps us get our podcast to a bunch of different directories. And then YouTube is free. So we just upload the video recording of our podcast to the YouTube channel so then people can watch the video as well. So that's kind of, and then, you know, getting a mic like this and a nice camera, it helps too as well. Sure. And that's kind of how we got started. And now we're on our second season and we're like 16 episodes into the second season. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, that's something that I've uh, really been interested in lately. Um, so, uh, yeah, I love to uh, yeah, talk about that more. Um, but, um, yeah, if I'm really could – I, could I just be uh, out here and honest with you? Um, it's a lot happening in the group. I see like with sponsors and things like that. Um, 
Yeah. And I just want to know, um, kind of, uh, and I'm asking it broadly still, because I'm, because I'm not sure how to put this in, in words. This, if I'm just being honest here, but kind of just what, what is, what is the, um, yeah, what do you, what do you see happening um, here? in the next few days and months, you know, with what's going on, if, if you get what I'm saying. With uh, how it becomes to, with COVID or with the mortgage business or with real estate? Yeah, in terms of COVID, um, in terms yeah. of real estate, um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of myself, if I, if I could just say it, um, I'm not sure if you know my situation here being a wholesaler indie. Um, Oh, I think uh, some things, huh? Things are getting tighter. Things are getting harder. Yes. Yes. Very. So that, that's a great question. So basically it's a struggle because properties are getting harder to find because there's more wholesalers and less properties for sale because there's kind of been a pinch on our, our buy and sell um, for real estate right now with our days on market and stuff and our, mm -hmm. how much inventory we have. So you have to get more creative and you, and the ways that you get more creative are if you offer your sellers um, to carry back the financing for you to buy the house. So you can have very little to nothing in the deal and then you can choose to flip that or you can resell it on a note and mortgage to somebody else. So you just have to get more creative and you have to kind of think outside the box. Like the standard wholesale mentality is just to offer a cash price to be a quick close and to get it as cheap as you can and to upsell it as quick as you can, as fast as you can to make that transactional money. And that works in certain markets, but right now it's very challenging and I, I feel for you. Um, and so my advice to you would be come up with creative ways to buy these properties on terms because you can pay what the seller wants to get paid for these properties and you can buy them on terms and you can resell them on terms again. It's called a wrap note. And you can have, so imagine if you got, this property and you paid exactly what they wanted you to pay, even though it was $20,000 higher than what you would pay for cash, but you got it at 0% interest. And then you resold that same property that you got while you're paying a debt to the, the, the previous seller and you charge them like an eight or 10% interest rate. And then they put down a down payment. And so that arbitrage or that spread in between those two payments, like you're paying 0% and someone else is paying eight to 10% on that payment. You make that difference of a few hundred dollars in between. And that's kind of how you can take a property, give the seller what they want, and then resell that property on another note and mortgage and be able to make that cash flow in between. So that's just a, it's just an idea of what you can do, but don't be afraid to ask, the seller to say, will you carry terms for me? I understand you want that price and I can't give you the all cash price that you want at that level. But what if you carry terms for me? What if, what if you, what if I didn't give you a down payment and you were 0% and then I deferred payments for three months so that you can go out and find somebody. I mean, that's a pretty awesome deal. So it does happen. It doesn't happen too often, but about every 20 deals that you come across, two or three of them will definitely be open to seller financing. Right, right. And, uh, and I want to know just at, at what point do you, do you go ahead and pull that trigger and just ask the seller, you know, I know in uh, traditional wholesales, it's, um, yeah. you know, you always want to get that cash offer pretty much things like that. But I'm, I'm understanding the process now, uh, you have to, you know, have to wait, uh, do the follow up and things like that. But um, I just want to know at what point do you make that I don't know at what point would be the best, uh, the best situation to make that offer to the seller, you know, that, um, well, that I, you I could. Would, yeah. I would say typically if you offer them the cash price and you can close quickly, you know, go, go with that because that's what you're used to. But if you're battling 15 other wholesalers for the same property, then tell them I can pay that price that you want. You just have to make, you just have to give me terms. And so they're my terms, but you, you get the price you want, but it's got to be with my terms. So no matter what they want for the price, you can pay it as long as your, your terms are in your favor, which would be 0% down, 0% interest, and maybe defer payments for a few months. This buys you time so you can resell the property to a borrower and um, get it paying again. So it's just all about being creative and just thinking outside the box on how you can out 
outdo your competition because most wholesalers won't use that strategy uh, just because they don't understand it. They're afraid to do it. But the ones that are doing it right now are the ones that are shining. So hope that helps. Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Awesome. All right, Albert. Thanks. Raise your hand again if you got another question. All right, let's see. Um, we'll ask a question here. Do you normally work with Baldwin pre or post bid? So it's, I don't run across a lot of sellers that want me to bid on the notes. Um, typically, more than likely, it's gonna be kind of fixed pricing. So I'm working with Dickie Baldwin before I buy the asset. So I'm doing some due diligence on the asset before what I call locking it up. And then once I lock it up, then I guess say, Hey, Dickie, I need to get a title search. I need to get a property uh, inspection done on the property so I can trust, but verify my due diligence. And that's really when, when I'm using Dickie. Um, we don't buy non-performing loans right now. But when we did, we would use somebody like Dickie also to help us out with skip tracing. I mean, we've had to do um, a genealogy report on somebody because the homeowner, they had passed away. And so no one took care of the house. All the heirs are out of state. And so it's just, um, it becomes pretty interesting how you have to get through a non-performing loan sometimes. And they, they could have big rewards though. So that's the good, the good part about them. So that's when I use Dickie Baldwin. <clears throat> All right. Looks like I think I got the board cleared here. Just walking through some of these. Cool. Anybody, if I didn't answer your question on the way, do not hesitate to um, jump out here and um, let me know. Feel free to use the raise your hand or write the Q and A or in the chat box. If you want to be unmuted, by all means, raise your hand and we can unmute you and we can talk through something. But a lot of good questions tonight. I'm glad that you guys asked them. It gets me a, it gives me a better feel for where you guys are at in the real estate notes and what you know, what you, what you, need, to, what you need to know. So, uh, oh, I like that graphic. It's a good graphic I found. Compliments to me. I'm glad to see that most of you are working from home and some of you probably are required to work uh, at a company building. Yeah. Thanks Lewis for putting that out there in the chat box. Um, he uh, recommended a book on lease options. I'm not a big fan of lease options. You still have to follow the CFEB and Dodd-Frank guidelines. So if you do more than a few of these options a year, you're, you're subject to those rules and regulations. Uh, lease options do have their place in my opinion. They have their place when your borrower hasn't proven they have either enough down payment or they don't have a good track record of paying. That would be a good thing to have a lease option to where you can get a seasoning of payments. You can still own the house and treat it as a rental. And then at the end, the option to buy it you can keep that option payment for yourself or you credit it towards the purchase price. So lease options do have their place, but we just prefer to do the note mortgage from the beginning anyways, because we don't want to own the properties. We just, we just want to be the bank on the property. All right, Linda, I see. Um, I have unmuted you, so feel free to unmute yourself. Hey, Justin, it's Linda. Can you hear me? I can, Linda. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Um, I have a, a question now. Do you or would you recommend using private money to buy notes? I would definitely recommend it. <laughs> I, I actually do it. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you put a, a certain certain percentage down? I mean, do you? I, I assume you use because you said it's in your investment um, that you're using self-directed, you know, part of a self-directed IRA and use part of the um, private money? Right. So there's a couple of different ways to use private money. You can get just a lump sum of cash from a private investor. And then you can say, 
I'm using this money to go out and purchase these loans and I'm going to pledge those loans to you. So if I don't make your payment, you take over those loans, if that makes any sense. So basically it's almost like getting a bank loan and you're using those monies to go buy loans and the security for the bank would be those, those notes that you buy. Um, another way to do it is that you could, they could fund the deals for you and then you could give them whatever their pro rata share is that you've agreed to. So sometimes you're borrowing money at, you know, four five, six, seven percent 7% interest rate, but you're buying loans that are maybe eight, nine, 10, maybe 11% interest rates. So those differences right. are ways to make those spreads. Um, then again, you can also just flip loans to somebody if they have money and be like, well, here, I'll, I'll sell you a loan. And then you work with the seller, then you can make kind of a commission. Yeah, I mean, kind of like wholesaling. Could you repeat that last part? You were breaking up. Oh, I'm sorry. So Please. flipping a loan can be like wholesaling to where mm -hmm. like in wholesaling, you buy a property as low as you can, and then you hurry up and sell it again to somebody at a higher margin, like maybe six or $7,000 more. So on a note, mm -hmm. you can do the same thing to where maybe you buy a note and then you immediately sell it to somebody else or you use their money to buy it and put it in their name. And then you work with the seller and make kind of a commission on or a kickback for buying that loan for putting the deal together. Okay. Is, is this a right environment to do um, such transactions? It is absolutely. Yeah. We, we've actually done a lot of deals in the last probably three or four months. We've done several, several deals like that. So for private money, what's a good deal um, for a private lender is like four or five percent. Yeah. So typically probably five, six, maybe seven percent would be the highest I go. It doesn't really make a lot of sense to borrow money at a higher rate than that. Um, right. most people don't, you know, they, they would look at that and say, that's not a very good rate of return. Why would somebody lend on it? Well, they, that person that's lending to you may use, be used to having a CD or a treasury bond or something to where it's a very low return and mm -hmm. it's more conservative play for them. Whatever you're borrowing from them, they have a lot of protection with what you're buying because everything's backed by real property. So what will be the terms, um, the length of the loan? It's whatever you want, wh whatever you can dictate. So we've done deals before for about three years and borrowed money at interest only, or sometimes it's amortized over, over 30 years, but it's a three year balloon. Mm -hmm. um, you can just get creative as you want. It's really, it's really up to you. I mean, how, I mean, how long do you typically hold a private money lenders money? Well, I'd like to hold it as long as I can, right? Because <laughs> I, I can use it as long as I want. I make money on right. It. It's up to the lender. So you make them feel comfortable. It's their money. It's you want them more comfortable with you than it is the amount of money that they're, that they're letting you borrow. And so typically I don't want to borrow money less than three years. I'd like to have three years with it. Uh, three to five years is just a good, good time horizon. If they mm -hmm. want to have their money deployed longer then you can consider selling them a note or you can do what they call a partial as well. It's where you can buy a note and you can sell them part of the note and then you keep the back part. So what do you give them as far as a, a guarantee or feel, feel like their money is secure? Is Excellent it, question. are they on the note or are they, what, what do you, yeah. They can. So they can either be on the note and then that would be more like a partial or you do what's called a collateral assignment to where you're pledging those assets to them for security. So if you think of a collateral assignment, it's similar for if you had a rental and you said bank, uh, bank of America, I have this rental and I want to borrow against the value of this. I want to use this rental as collateral. I'm like, okay, yeah, we'll give you a mortgage and then we'll use this rental as collateral. Similar with a note. So you go to a private investor and say, I'm going to give you a collateral assignment that pledges this note to you in the event I default, and that's your collateral. So it's a secured loan with a loan. <laughs> okay, all right, all right, I I'm getting it. <laughs> yeah. All right. 
I'm sorry, I'm so new to it. I'm sure this is, I don't know, very elementary. No, so no, no, that, that's a very advanced technique. Um, people don't get in the note business doing it that way. After you understand the finances and how the business works, you, you realize how you can leverage that to your advantage. And that's just a technique that we've started doing the last couple of years. Yeah, because I, I have limited cash flow, but I'm thinking, okay, how can I leverage my time and other people's money Exactly. Um, to make a, yeah, you know, yeah, you know, have a win win. So that, that's you know. how I started in the note business. Um, didn't have a lot of my own money, just bought a couple loans and like the IRA that I could afford and then just kind of build it by flipping loans as well. So I would find investors that would want to buy loans and I would have the sources to buy loans. And then I would just basically flip them loans that way and help build, build my nest egg here. Okay, and are you using the um, self-directed IRA to build your network? Kind of. The retirement account is a separate play. We do put money in oh. there as we can, and then we just we just build it and let it grow. So as it grows, big enough to buy another loan, we buy another loan, and then it just keeps expanding and contracting like this. And eventually, it's going to have a very large pool of loans that are going to get us through retirement pretty easily. So our company money is different. Like I said before, we use more of a velocity model to where we'll buy loans and sell loans pretty quickly and just make the, the transactional money in between to run the business. <clears throat> okay. But you, so you're not using self-directed IRAs. I am for, for our retirement notes. Yeah. We, we have self-directed money, but I don't use them in conjunction with the company because that would be a. Okay. Uh, right. Right. Yeah. Double dipping. I got it. Yes. I got it. I got it. All right. Thank I'm sorry to take up a lot of time. Oh, you're fine. Yeah. Ask away. That's what the open mic is for. So this is the first time we've done open mic. So it's kind of my first, my first crack at it. So. Appreciate it. Thanks. You're welcome. All right. Any other questions out there? I'm gonna check the board again. See my buddy Jim out there. I'm sure he's got a good question. Mm -hmm. Feel free to ask some more questions. I'm going to advance to the next slide at least. So the next note meetup that we have is going to be Wednesday, October 14th from 6 to 8 p.m. Probably going to be on Zoom. I'm not sure if we're going to have a live meeting. It will definitely be on Zoom no matter what. We'll either be live in person and then stream it on Zoom at the same time, or it'll just be Zoom only. So it's probably safe to say, thanks, Jim. <laughs> it's probably safe to say um, it's probably going to be on Zoom again. So just feel free to, to however you got a hold of us this time to be on the meetup. There's a lot of, lot of new faces out there, and I appreciate you guys uh, checking us out tonight. So don't forget to follow us on social media at Bright Path Notes uh, for Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, we got the Two Wealth Show. That's the podcast that I'm on with Super Eat. Uh, subscribe to that if you would. Reach out to me, Justin, at brightpathnotes.com. And we also have a Facebook group. It's called Be The Bank Real Estate Note Investing. And this little logo in the background, this Be The Bank logo, is the, uh, the group kind of uh, cover photo, if you will. And so if you'd like to join that, I know a few of you on the call right now um, are actually in the group as well. So we have three or four people that kind of moderate it and answer questions. So it's your time to kind of throw some deals out there or some questions. I know Luis was out there. He has a couple of great questions before. A few other people have been on as well and asked some good questions. We just kind of help you get through some challenges or just if you're starting out the business, what to do and where to go. Excuse me. So um, I'm back up here and I got a few more questions that popped up on the board. Uh, Sharon says, can I do notes flipping in this economic climate? And the answer is yes, you can. So I noticed that in February, January and February, 2020, things were kind of like normal with investing as far as like investors were definitely 
able to deploy capital and they were investing in passive investments like notes all the time. And then the middle of March came around and then kind of everybody just put the brakes on everything and they didn't know what was going on. They didn't understand how this was going to affect things. They didn't know about the sort of stimulus packages that the government put out. And so March and April and part of May were like really slow and investors really started to get comfortable like the middle of May to the beginning of May. Uh, as far as they saw the dust settling, they, they looked at the economy and said, okay, it appears that uh, there's a lot of job losses and forbearances, but by golly, real estate didn't really get affected, at least in our local area that much. There's a few pockets around the country that did get affected pretty good. But for the most part, real estate was pretty resilient to it. And that was the key indicator for investors to be like, well, I mean, it hasn't really changed that much. They kind of dived in. So we had, we had a lot of deals um, May all the way to now that have been uh, completed because investors are out there and they're still moving and grooving. So it's still a really good economic time to flip notes or flip houses or, or whatnot. There is a lot more money out there that's sitting on the sidelines and has been sitting on the sidelines since 2010. And it's, it's probably in the billions still today. A lot of these big IRA companies, they always shoot out information and say, hey, look, we still have you know, X amount of money that's not even been deployed and sitting in our self-directed IRA accounts because people are uh, scared to deploy their capital because they don't know what to do. They don't, they don't want another 2010. They just know they don't want it in the stock market. And so there's plenty of money out there to deploy. And remember this forbearance stuff, it's, it's only delinquency. It's less than 7% of all these mortgages are in forbearance. So what does that tell you? About 92%, 93% of all mortgages are just fine. So, I mean, that data just shows that we're in a really healthy and strong environment when it comes to mortgages and real estate notes and real estate right now. Um, so I don't see it changing that much. I, I see it on a downward trend for the past two or three months. Um, so uh, I think another wave kind of came through with COVID-19 and, and it looked kind of scary, but things have kind of tapered off again. So we'll see. Uh, things can change. Like I said, I don't have a crystal ball, but I got a rear view mirror. And so I'm just focused on there's still good deals out there. And there's still good people out there and uh, we're still making really good transactions. So we're happy to see that. Over that an long winded answer again, Sharon, sorry. <laughs> so we've still got quite a few of you on the, on the call. Um, by all means, you know, we got uh, about an hour and a half in today's meeting. So feel free to ask some more questions. Otherwise we can sign off. And like I said, this is being recorded. So I'll be able to upload this to our YouTube channel for you guys, anyone to rewatch it if they couldn't get on. All right, Luis has a question. All right, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hello, can you yes, hear me? Yes, I can. Awesome. Uh, quick question here. The um... You know, I was thinking about like using a traditional IRA, right, to do uh, to to get a to acquire maybe like a performing note, right? And everything goes well, but then I I thought about this, like if it ever goes to non-performing, and you know I have to take it through bankruptcy, and now you know I'm holding the home in the IRA, you know I could rent or I could sell it and whatnot, but there's there's really no way at that point to get that that home out of that IRA account and move it to like my LLC so that I can do a rental and take advantage of like deductions and things from it, right? There, there always is a way and it may be a little tricky. So mm -hmm. I am not the expert in doing that, but yeah. I haven't personally experienced going through that. But what I've heard is you basically have to transfer this property into an entity that isn't owned by you or a business partner or a spouse or a relative gotcha. and then get it from there to your LLC. And so there's been some tricky ways. I've seen some attorneys do this stuff. Um, and it has to do with creating like a note outside of a, outside of anything that you're a part of. Um, yeah. So there, there is a way to do it. It's, it's quite tricky and, and, difficult, but 
I, I'm pretty sure it can be done. Um, so that's, that's something I really don't have a concrete answer for, but you'd probably want to talk to like a Jeff Watson or somebody that's, or John Heyer or somebody that's really good in the note space and real estate space that knows what they're doing. So they, they can, they can guide you through that. If, if that yeah, happens. definitely. Thank you. Now, if it sounds like if it's doable, then uh, that, that kind of gives me some confidence to go and ask an attorney then. Right. Thanks. Yeah, I def definitely ask one of those guys or if they have an open mic or an open forum to ask those questions, I definitely would ask them. I could be way off, but I think I've heard of somebody doing that. Like I've heard of people foreclosing on themselves in their retirement account and, and getting out of things. Um, it's, I haven't gone through it, so I don't have the mechanics in, in, the, in the front of my mind right now. But I, I've, I kind, I kind of want to say I, I think you can do something like that. Awesome. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, Jason. You're welcome. Thanks for being on. You bet. All right. All right. So Philip asked, how do I feel about buying notes in second lien position? That's a great question. There are a lot of guys and gals that make a good living buying non-performing seconds or just buying performing seconds. Um, I don't really get into that. I like to be in the first position. Um, it's another layer of, of comfort, being comfortable with it. And then again, it's another layer of discount on the note that you have to take into consideration. So if you're in the second position, you definitely don't wanna pay 100% of value, right? you want to pay probably a lot less than you would in the first position, because what if, what if the first stops paying? What if the second stops paying? Um, you know, if you're in the second position and someone else owns the first and you have to foreclose in the second, then guess what? You still got to pay the first, right? So there's, there's good and bad to it. From what I understand, and I know I'm, like I said, a long winded answer here. Um, you, if you buy non-performing seconds, if that's, what your your question alluded to, Philip, um, which I don't know if it is, I'm paraphrasing. So you would have to buy probably, you know, five to 10 of those non-performing seconds for a couple of them to pay off really big in your favor. Otherwise, I hear that if you just buy one or two at a time, you, the chances are not in your favor for it to, to pay off or to pan out very well at all. So just wanted to point that out there. That's kind of my take on it. So I don't, it doesn't bother me if I had it. I mean, I've created seconds before, but I haven't initially gone out and bought seconds. Good question though. All right. So you guys can stay on the call. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just end the recording right now, but I'm going to leave the, I'm going to leave the call up here for anyone that wants to stay on and have a chat. I'm still more than welcome to do that. So for those of you that are, I'm signing off from the recording.